It's exactly eight o'clock and I'm going to keep to time this evening because we have such an interesting main speaker. I know we want every moment with him. Um, but first of all, I wanted to just welcome you to this BBC series. Um, it's a hundred years, it's a centenary of the BBC, not just this month, but in fact today, which I'll explain in a moment. Um, and so we're delighted to be running this series about the Jewish contribution to the BBC and looking at the history of the last 100 years. Last week, we started with an overview of the emigre contribution. David Hendy, author of the BBC A People's History, um, in conversation with Daniel Stoneman, a former senior producer, talked about the emigre contribution. And one of the things that they, the conclusions they came to was the importance of that influence in the early days in bringing both a cosmopolitanism a cultural intellectualism and an internationalism to the BBC. Well, tonight we have a current um, speaker from the BBC, Alan Yentob, who's going to be introduced more in a moment, but with his Iraqi heritage, with his cosmopolitan and intellectual worldview, he's absolutely in that tradition. And we're really excited to hear him speak, hear about his contribution to the BBC, but also that intersection between the BBC and Jewish life in Britain during his career. So I said today, it's not just this month is the anniversary of the BBC, it was actually at 6 p.m. today, um, dead on six. I watched the clock turn and thought 100 years ago exactly. This is when the radio waves first started broadcasting. And look how far we've come. Um, hopefully tonight will be a celebration of that as well as an intellectual engagement and interrogation. To be in conversation with Alan Yentob, I'd like to introduce you to Monica Bohm Dushan. Monica is a familiar face to many people. She is the founding director of Insiders Outsiders, which is the festival of emigre history and looking at the emigre contribution to Jewish arts and culture in this country. She's also a regular contributor to Jewish Renaissance and on our board. So, Monica over to you. Thank you very much, Aviva. Now, I think many of you will know that I don't normally introduce the main speaker with somebody else's words, but on this occasion, I'm actually going to differ in my approach slightly by, well, not exactly quoting, but sort of paraphrasing something that I came across, Alan, in a 2016 article, which in fact, I think you yourself alerted me to by Sam Knight in The Guardian, called Alan Yentob, The Last Impresario, which I think is uh, not insignificant. So if I may, I will more or less read what seems to me absolutely the right way to introduce you. So here, here goes. Alan Yentob has been Britain's most influential TV executive of the last half century or so. No one in the history of the BBC, the world's most successful public service broadcaster, has ever held such a sequence of powerful jobs. Controller of BBC Two, uh, controller of BBC One, BBC Television Director of Programmes, Director of Drama, Entertainment and Children's Programming, and Creative Director, last but not least, from 2004 till 2015. And then Sam Knight goes on, Quite rightly, I think he says, even then, the titles don't capture it. It makes much more sense to think about Yentob in terms of the programmes you yourselves have watched. If you've enjoyed any in the following well, 50 years or so, Omnibus, Arena, The Orson Welles Story, The Late Show, Have I Got News For You, Wallace and Gromit, absolutely fabulous. You get the idea of the extraordinary range of programmes with which Alan has been involved and behind. Pride and Prejudice, one could go on on and on and on indeed, Sam says, then you will be or have been enjoying the work and creative decisions of Alan Yento. Uh, what he doesn't mention there is of course, the program that has brought you, I think very firmly back or into the public eye for maybe a younger generation as well, namely the wonderful series of uh, Imagine, which is very much ongoing as we as we speak. So Alan, thank you so much for agreeing to, to be here tonight. And um, what 
we agreed we should do it, the obvious place to start. Start by telling us about that very distinctive Jewish background from which you, you emerged and in which you, you grew up. You'll need, I'm sorry, you need to unmute yourself. Sorry, I'm no. unmuted, yeah? Yeah, I, um, I come from a, uh, a Sephardic Jewish family which comes from Iraq. And um, my mother came over in the 1930s and she actually ended up in Scotland. Um, we've been around my family, you know, in the place called Kakubri, spelt K-I-R-K-C-U-D-B-R-I-G-H-T. And I still have family there you know, nearly a hundred years later, they're still there, based there. Uh, and uh, my family, my mother's uh, brothers and my, 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 my father ended up in Manchester. We were, I was born in London, but we lived in Manchester for a very long time in the textile trade. And there were many Jews in the textile trade in Manchester. And actually I would wake up, you're talking about immigrants. We talk about the situation now with Ukrainian refugees. I honestly would wake up some mornings in, in this house that we inhabited and I'd be, find myself side by side as a sort of six-year-old or seven-year-old with somebody who didn't speak English and who came from Iraq and who was a, an immigrant and who had left Iraq as many had to uh, because of the circumstances there. So I very much felt myself the child of, uh, of, of an immigrant family and uh, the fascination and interest in that has always, I've retained it, you know. Um, as for the Jewishness, yes, it was always, I can't say I was a, I'm a religious Jew or anything, but being Jewish is something I'm immensely proud of, and I hope I'm not going to be let down by the state of Israel in the next few years. Um, and, you know, that, that was my beginning, growing up, coming to London, and eventually I did actually decide to study law and I went to um, uh, Leeds University because for various reasons I didn't go to Oxbridge because I, I didn't have a Latin O-level even. Um, and I went to Sorbonne and, uh, and um, Grenoble University for a year. And, um, and then I had to decide what I was going to do. Well, when I was at university, I was at Leeds University, I, I did a lot of drama and I got, I was studying law, but I got slightly disappointed with, I, I sort of wanted to be a human rights lawyer or some description, but somehow or other, the distraction of, of drama and theatre and all the rest of it was something that took to me. And I ended up doing that and, and making a, winning the National Union of Students drama competition, which the Sunday Times held. And I had co-directed it and, uh, and starred in it. I was never off stage. It was a, uh, uh, it was a play called the, the Chinese Wall by Max Frisch. Anyway, when it came, I'm now getting to the point of this transition point in my life when I made some applications. So I applied to the Royal Court uh, and I applied to the BBC and the BBC application form said it was for a, something called the general trainee scheme and it said at the top of the application form um we get thousands of entries for these five jobs uh if you are interested in taking it you need to make it clear to us why we should choose you now i i can't remember what i wrote but i did get the job and i was the first person non-oxbridge person to get it let alone whether I was the first Jewish person or not, will come to, I have no idea. But then um, I decided that 20 years later, maybe more, 30 years later, I gave the first BAFTA lecture. And I said to the BBC, have you, have you kept the, um, my application form? Can, I, can you see in their files? And they found this very untidy uh, application form responding to that question about why you and some of it I had was handwritten and some was typed and I was a very bad typer so I gave up in the middle I mean just looking at that mess you might wonder why you could ever possibly be chosen anyway in answer to their question I wrote the following I discovered when I when I read my, I saw it at the age of eight I played one of the wives in the Merry Wives of Windsor and one of my contemporaries said you have lovely legs you should be in show business 
Now, it was very unlikely. I then went on with my other qualifications, but whenever I now get a doctorate or whatever, something like that, some recognition, especially when I, I'm giving um, the offering students that I was when I got a doctorate at Leeds University there, uh, their degrees, I read this out and say, and now I'm director of television at the BBC, so go for it. You know, anything, anything will happen. Arriving at the BBC was a revelation. I arrived in Bush House. Talk about emigres, talk about 24-7. It was an extraordinary life. That place was buzzing from morning till, till dawn. You know, it was till night. It just went round the clock. And on my very first job, this is where I met my first Jewish client, if you like, I, I interviewed for radio, and I was 20 years old, Harold Pinter and Idi Amin. They were my two interviewees. And I, I, I want to say something about the BBC because a lot of people, you know, particularly you know, the Israeli embassy at various stages and things like people wonder about the BBC and its attitude to to Jews, its attitude to women for that matter, and uh, to minorities. But people, I don't think, quite realize just how significant Jewish figures have been in the BBC uh, and in broadcasting generally. For instance, um, around the time that I arrived at the BBC, Granada Television was very powerful. Who was running Granada Television? A man called Sidney Bernstein. That's who was running Granada Television. Who was at LWT? Who were the other powerful family, both in theatre and, and in television? The Grades. Lou Grade, Michael Grade, who went on to do things. So that's Yorkshire and LWT. Then there's a man called Paul Fox, who is still alive, by the way, and in his mid-90s, who was the, uh, the man running uh, Yorkshire Television. So there was, a, there was an incredible presence of those. And, and within the BBC, um, just so you know this, you know, the news operation... And you're getting one of those people who, who was involved with the news. Um, Mark um, Damazer is coming to speak to, to, um, to you at some point. Um, many of the significant heads of the BBC, Dame Jenny Abramsky, a uh, very powerful figure in the news. Um, James, Gray, uh, uh, James Harding, who was, was the editor of the, um, of the Times and then came to the BBC and I brought him in. Um, Danny Cohen, Michael Grade, um, and then if you look beyond again, um, outside that, Michael Green, Carlton Television, and all the rest of it. So, you know, the British media has not been uh, sort of, there's been no an anti-Semitism at the top of the BBC about the British media. I mean, the other part of my story and my narrative is um, that somehow this history that we all have, this story we can tell or not tell, is one that has made a big impact on me because the, I have made friendships making all these programs over the years. And some of the, these things have not just been professional relationships, quite the opposite. Um, and among those people with whom I've had made a lifetime friendship are Stanley Kubrick, Philip Roth, Arthur Miller, Mel Brooks, Anish Kapoor, Tom Stoppard, you know, and then there are sort of ancillaries, Stephen Fry, Bob Geldof, many people who come to acknowledge their Judaism at a, at a later stage. But for me, um, even th these friendships go beyond that. You know, I, uh, I mean, I consider these people I've mentioned, Mel Brooks, Stanley Kubrick, Philip Roth, Arthur Miller, certainly, and the, I mean, to be among my closest, closest friends. And the, the Jewish connection was a very important one, but there's many, many entertaining narratives about that. Some of you may have seen the programs I've done with Mel Brooks and Philip Roth or even, even Stanley Kubrick and Arthur Miller. They're all, some of them are on the, on the, but, um, it was funny with, with Philip, particularly, I should talk about, he came to live in England and I got to know him very well. Uh, and I got to love him, you know, and um, 
then when he went back to America, one day we made, I made a film about him on Arena. It wasn't made by me, but it was made by um, somebody else on my behalf because I was running the Strand. And um, then Philip Ross said to me one day in around the, I think, just, you know, it was sort of around two, 2000, Alan, why aren't you doing a program about me? Why didn't you make one yourself? So I said, okay, and we, we started to make it. And then eventually uh, we would have this great exchange on the telephone. And then he would ring and he say, he would say to me, Alan, I've decided uh, no programs before the year 2000, no, no, no books before the year 2000, which means of course, that Port Royce complaint is that's out and all the rest of it. So that was, that was not a good start. And then a few days would pass and there would be another phone call. Alan, no Jew talk. And that's all we ever talked about. So I sacked him. And I said, I'm not doing it. You know? And um, I, I didn't need to. And I thought, you know, because I think I could have sort of taken him through it. But I, I ended up getting him an interview with somebody else, which was quite tedious. And, and then he pushed me again a bit later. Alan, can we do it? Can we do it? And I said, OK, but the rules are this. I decide everything and you've got no control over anything. It, it, that's the only terms on which I'm going to make this. So he conceded and I got my revenge. And I don't know if anyone's seen these programs, but it's one of the most fun bits. I basically chose to use um, the most preposterous bits of Portnoy and read them out to him. And it wasn't just me, another big fan of, um, of Phillips, who was also a great friend of mine is Salman Rushdie. <coughs> and Salman was also a big fan. And we would read these things in the program out to Philip, the most embarrassing bits, which he was trying to forget. And he said, how can you do this to me? I'm a distinguished man of eight, I'm a distinguished writer of eight years old. I said, sorry, that's the deal. And I carried on anyway, that, that was my, Philip Roth encounter. Um, Arthur Miller is another person who, for many years, I got to know. He spoke to me very honestly about Marilyn. I got to know him. Britain, you've got to remember, with Arthur Miller. Arthur Miller never got the recognition he really deserved in the US. I mean, they would ignore him in New York and on Broadway. And eventually, it was people uh, like Richard Eyre who brought him to the National Theatre, brought him here. And he was really very close to Britain in that sense. Um, Arthur lived very close to Philip as well, and they would see each other. And <clears throat> um, so I got to know Arthur. I did a program with him in the 80s. And then I did a program with him around the 2001, 2002, just before he died. And I went to stay with him. And I... I slept in a room next to him and I cooked him meals. His wife had died at that point. And, um, and I made this film about him. Uh, and it was a terribly intimate conversation about his time and his life and his work. And six months later, before the, just before the program went out, Arthur died. So again, that was a very important connection with me. Um, as was Stanley. And again, I, I don't know, I, I just sort of invent these things. Stanley Kubrick, I had no idea really at the time that I first met him, but he was actually living in in England. Can you hear me, Seal, and see me? Yeah, but someone's ringing, so don't pay any attention to that. Um, and um, I, I ended up um, spending time, you know, with, with Stanley and getting to know him really well and there was something very Jewish about Stanley. He always, um, he was a bulk buyer. You know, he, li he liked the best deal possible, Stanley. You know, um, so he, one of the reasons I think, he, he liked all my shows and we got on incredibly well. But he also thought the BBC gets a very good deal. You know, they managed to get people at not too high a price. So he, was, he used to ring me up to ask me what I was paying my, my cameraman and what I was doing for that. And Stanley, as you know, people who worked on those films just fell for him. And uh, so during that period, he might, whether it was Tom Cruise or it was Jack Nicholson, whoever it was, 
the contract would start and they'd say, well, we're going to, we're going to do a show for, um, it will, it'll be a three month shoot, but it never was a three month shoot. It was, it could well be a two year shoot when it came to Stanley. Um, and he was a man again, who lived a 24 seven life. He was never asleep because he was always talking to LA or being here or being there. And this question of Jewishness again with Stanley, it wasn't, um, not an obvious thing. He, it wasn't that he was a religious Jew, but there's no question that that, that connection, that history links us all. Uh, and I would say here that at some point, some of you may again have seen this, I, I did make a, uh, a program uh, called, um, a, a radio program called The Last Jews of Iraq, which some of you may have heard. And it was a point at which BBC Radio asked me if I would talk about what happened to the Jews in Iraq and tell that story. And that really did interest me. And I started to tell it. I couldn't, in fact, go to Iraq because I was at that stage, you know, the creative director of the BBC. And there was a real sense that I would put at risk the lives of people working with me if we were to go to Iraq. And I think there's no doubt that's true. So basically, I started to ask my parents, friends and relatives about their experience of leaving Iraq. And it was incredibly moving. And I found that one of the most interesting projects I've ever made. I discovered things about people I had no idea about before. And it, it's an extraordinary fact that the when I was making this program, there were only, once upon a time, a third of the population of Baghdad was Jewish. Um, and then, you know, after the, liber after the Israeli liberal you know the the foundation of israel after the second world war all these things contributed to this sort of um increased anti-semitism the middle east also rejecting jews jews being sent back and uh sent wherever they were sent and and departing as did my family at that stage um but what was interesting was at the time that i made these programs about five years ago the only surviving Jewish members in, in people in Baghdad were there were five people left alive. So you couldn't do a shiver, you could do nothing. Where the majority of Jews were hiding out was in the American embassy. There were more Jews in the American embassy employed by the United States government there, than there were in the rest of Baghdad. So that in itself is a pretty amazing thing. Um, Alan, I wonder if I might just sort of interject there, uh, apropos the, you know, your background and your interesting term just now, the, you said you talked about that history as though Jewish history might be something quite homogeneous and monolithic. And of course, there is a very distinct difference in the experiences of the Iraqi, the Mizrahi, Safadi Jews and the Ashkenazi ones. You grew up largely in Manchester by the sound of it, where you were aware growing up of you belonging to very distinct brand of Jewishness, if you like. In yes, a very distinct brand of and, and a sort of, yes, that's certainly true. I was aware of become, belonging to a very distinct brand of Jewishness and, uh, and a minority. I, mm -hmm. We felt like a minority. And those Iraqi Jews have dispersed across the world. My brother, every Wednesday night, for since COVID began, has a uh, a Zoom call with all our relatives across, the, I mean this, I mean there are about 89 different generations, different people and we we do this, we choose a theme and we discuss, it might be who are the photographers in the family, who are the artists, let's talk about the history, let's have a cooking lesson and we do that and it's, I mean, it's amazing to see these people growing up in different parts of the world, all with this connection and all anxious to retain that connection, even though they are several generations away and I think in my family particularly my brother I'm who who does it and he's the one who is at the heart of this this zoo um, we are we, we have retained this connection with family members in fact we were recently in this place I told you about Kukubri and 120 members of the family came there 
um, six months ago. And we do this every five years. Everyone congregates. And then every year, if everyone is around, we come together. So this idea of a, a community and people who have things in common and a, a shared history is incredibly important. On a related subject, I was intrigued to read somewhere that your first contact, I don't know if this is correct or not, with the BBC was in the form of a family friend, somebody called Naim Basri, who was in charge of Arabic music in the BBC. Right. A nice, nice little irony there, perhaps. And you've mentioned yeah. Salman Rushdie. I believe you're a good friend of Hanif Qureshi as well. And I wonder if you might like to say something about perhaps some, I'm just speculating here, sort of a sense of rapport perhaps with Muslims from, you know, the world in which yeah. your family emerged. Well, Salman Rushdie, there is actually on the iPlayer, I think it's still there. The first program I made with Salman Rushdie was over 40 years ago, 41 years ago, before anyone knew who he was. I read Midnight's Children and I loved it and I was making the arena programs. And Salman was at that stage working in the advertising world. And I read the book, I thought it was brilliant. And I made a program with him and we put it out um, the day before the stabbing. I, I had no, obviously it was to come. Mm -hmm. And Salman has, I have to say, I'm in close touch with him very much so. And he's been absolutely courageous. And I think we also have to give credit to all those people in that auditorium who jumped on stage to help him. I mean, that was incredible. And to get the support of President Biden and, and, and rulers across the planet. For the last, I mean, I, I met Salman then, and he's one of my very closest friends. And I was with Salman Rushdie on the day of the fatwa. And people may have seen this film I made also called Salman's Story, which was an imagined film which went out when he wrote his sort of coda, sort of um, autobiography. Um, and, you know, we talked about that first day when he was with me. I had a driver, a BBC driver. Those were the days when you had a BBC driver. You don't anymore. You go by bus. Uh, but... Uh, he was um, he was with me and I took him and then I would see him and for all for about five years when we would see him it was always with security men with machine guns with guns with whatever he was never on his own and then for the past 15 years Salman has been able to lead a normal life until the moment he walked into that auditorium and there was no one to sort of say you know let's see what you've got in your bag and he went in and You've seen what happened, and um, I'm glad to say that he is he is blind in one eye, and he was stabbed 12 times, but he's recovering. I would say that also at the time of the first fatwa, um, he appeared and talked about Satanic Versus on The Late Show, which is a show that I introduced to TV, and um, soon after that... Um, the fatwa came and there was a group of people, including Hanif Qureshi and um, Harold Pinter and uh, various other prominent, eminent writers who got behind Salman uh, and we did at the time ran a campaign for him. And yes, another person who was part of that was Hanif. Uh, and yes, I, I do. I, the, I, I did actually um, commission um, a lot of Hanif's work for television, some of which is is out there right now. Buddha of Suburbia, for instance, probably on could be on the iPlayer right now. And the documentary that I made, not just one but two with Hanif, and um, we are we are still incredibly close. And um, a group of people, you know, you know, we're, we're Jewish and Muslim, and uh, and so we we all we're all very much part of the first of the same world. I mean, the person I haven't mentioned is my closest of all these friends, and that is Mel Brooks. And um, I mean, really, um, Alistair Campbell once introduced this and said, you seem to finish off each other's sentences. You're, you're like father and son. Mel incidentally is 96. And Mel said to Alistair Campbell at the time, yes, that's true, but he's the father and I'm the son, you know, that's, that's Mel Brooks for you. Um, and I, I first met Mel in, again, many, many years ago, in over 40 years ago. And 
I made a film with him called I Thought I Was Taller, a short history of Mel Brooks. And then I'd made various other shows and then anyone who's seen uh, the film that I mentioned, the um, Mel Brooks Unwrapped, will see this sort of love story go back 40 years. I've just returned actually from LA, just spending time with him. And he's just written his autobiography, which if anyone hasn't read it, it's uh, um, you know out now in paperback and it's called typically All About Me. Um, and um, yes, this sort of friendship is obviously a Jewish connection and it's very, very powerful. And I used to, Carl Reiner was also a great friend of mine. And whenever I would go to, and, and Mel Brooks is the godfather of my son and, and Bancroft is the godmother of my daughter. She's a Catholic girl, but she's very much part of that. That sort of, it's fascinating that, you know, they, they, they certainly have a kind of strong, American showbiz is, a lot of it is Jewish. I mean, Hollywood is packed with Jews. I've just been talking about the BBC, but in Hollywood, it's, there would, there would be no musicals without Jews. I made a film about that too. I mean, uh, there would be no national anthem in America if it wasn't written by a Jew, you know, so they've, they've made their, their case. Uh, anyway, so uh, Mel Brooks and I talk on the phone, you know, twice a week and, um, he's he's a remarkable figure and I, one thing i do remember which i'll never ever forget was my visit to a theater in north london in hampstead to watch the producers when it first came out and there's a famous scene in the producers where when the audience are watching springtime for hitler they've all got their hands on their mouths and they they cannot believe what they're seeing and that's what I, what the whole audience in Hampstead, the North London Jewish audience, they could not believe they were looking at this film. And um, it's, no, no one would get, he gets away with those things. I mean, Blazing Saddles, the story, you know, the nigger story and the, all of that, the sheriff and um, the producers. I mean, he's, he's a rule breaker um, and a remarkable, remarkable figure. Anything you want to ask me? Now, yes, I, I think, I mean, cool. and he's American, and I'm just wondering, as you've been speaking, yes, I don't think anybody would question for a moment this basic point that there's a disproportionate number of Jewish individuals in the BBC, as indeed in other sort of areas of British society in Hollywood, you know, without, without question. But I think there's a difference, and it's something that I think Aviva will bear me out on, that actually as we've been approaching people to participate in this centenary series, we know there are many Jews, we know who some of them are. An awful lot of them were very reticent about, in a sense, coming out as Jews in public, partly because some of them are still working for the BBC and perhaps you know, that's something one might talk about. But I just wonder whether there's something very different between the American sense of Jewishness. You know, who do we have? Maybe Howard Jacobson perhaps in, in the novel, but you know, this sort of very upfront design to, you know, sort of outrage in a sense attitude to being Jewish. Um, I don't think yeah. we do. I, I'm not sure it's fair to even say about Jewish, about writers, American writers who are Jewish, you know, with Arthur or Philip or others like that. Uh, I mean, I, for instance, I, one of my, the th people I most admired at meeting when it was so extraordinary thing was Isaac Rousseau, the singer, you know, mm -hmm. from America. And yes, that was about immigration and the rest of it. But I think there is an element. I mean, I've just recently made a film with Tom Stoppard as well. And Tom has been a friend of mine for many years, but Tom was kind of in denial about his Jewishness. And one of the reasons is a reason that, generally speaking, immigrants escaping from some horrible travesty of, of whatever. Now, he escaped from, um, you know, Czechoslovakia and he had to come he went first to to to, Ch to Singapore, then to China, and then to um, Mumbai, to India, and finally arrived. His father died, um, was killed in the war, uh, his Jewish father, and he ended up coming to England. And he felt he had been, his life had been saved, and that Britain had saved his life. So he, and his his father, as anyone who watches the film will, will see, or will have seen, is... Uh, his stepfather was an anti-Semite. He, he didn't really, you know, he, 
you know, he lives, and the film I make is, anyone who's seen Leopoldstadt will see that this is where he comes to terms with something he was in denial of, or he, he wanted to just leave in the back room till he was in his 50s. And this book is the first time he confronted it. It's now a huge hit on Broadway. He's just been there, Tom, and just come back. So this film was about me teasing him and confronting him with this question. And I know a number of people, um, like Stephen Frears, the director, who didn't know that he was Jewish. Um, and they're quite, you're right in that sense that people are more necessarily reluctant to own up to it. Jonathan Miller, by the way, is a figure in both television and uh, and but who, again, you know, it wasn't about him acknowledging his Jewishness, but there was no question that he was. Um, so I, 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 I think, I, and one thing I have to say is that I personally, yeah, now this is an important point. I mean, if you go online, when I did, when I was director of television, Charles Saatchi was very involved in the media, obviously someone I was very close to at the time. My, our families were close friends. Uh, Michael Green ran Carlton TV. And if you could read abusive stuff online in the early years, which was absolutely the British media is controlled by these by these Jews. And it went beyond that. Even now, you'll probably find that it, saying not just them, but they would invent uh, and Michael Gray is another one whose name was mentioned, but they would add names and say that person's Jewish and that person's Jewish. So this this sort of anti-Semitism was out there, but I never felt it inside the organization, nor do I believe any of those other people were. But you want your identity. You don't want, it's like this whole thing about being Muslim. I mean, there is also this question of how you integrate, how you become part of a bigger community, how even when you talk to a taxi driver in New York, even if you can't understand what they're saying, they're proud to be Americans. You, We need to find a world where these two things can sit side by side. And I, I do believe, actually, if you look at the way that Jewish culture uh, uh, has been integrated into, you know, in, in many countries, into, into the, the lifestyle, um, particularly, you know, in media and, and, and the movie industry and the rest of it, you know, it's, it's, um, it's good. It's, it's something comes from there. Paul Simon, people like this who have, you know, these great writers and figures who have influenced um, music and, and, and film culture. I wonder if we could go back to what you were saying about the world out there versus the BBC and the fact that you yourself haven't experienced any anti-Semitism directly. Um, I wonder, I mean, this whole idea of the Jews' domination of the media, I mean, this is a long-standing trope, isn't it, among the yeah. anti-Semites? And I wonder, I mean, I'd be quite honest here, that actually when we were first sort of formulating our ideas for this series, uh, at least one member of our team was very wary of the possible, you know, that that becoming the dominant sort of um, theme, if you like, and was 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 worried that this might... Be well, no, let me just say that I think, here's a very good example why it isn't. I mean, I mentioned BBC's heads of news, their commitment was to the BBC and to the values of the BBC. Very often, you know, the, the Israeli ambassadors would feel, you know, they would criticize stuff. And really, um, as I've said, you know, Mark will talk more personally about this, Mark Damaser. The, the BBC maintained scrupulously, as far as it could, it makes mistakes, but by and large, it, it, it stink, sticks with it, to the rules of impartiality and fairness. And that is how the BBC's heads of news applied things. And they didn't want to have a, a, a sort of a box which said, I am Jewish, I am Jewish. So that, that wasn't discussed, and nor should it be. And that's why I can understand, particularly people working in the news area or elsewhere, at a time, you've got to remember that this anti-Semitism issue has become, since the, you know, the Corbyn era and the rest of it has become very much into the foreground. And there's no question that this is going on uh, in the UK. Uh, but it wasn't something much talked about once upon a time. And so I think now, uh, I, I think I can see why people are being cautious uh, about it, which is why I say, I want to make it clear, I haven't myself experienced anti-Semitism and that people who work in broadcasting in the BBC uh, need to embrace the culture, that culture, and not sort of, I'm, I'm a Tory, I'm a Jew, I'm a this, I'm a that. It's, I'm an employee of the BBC serving 
the public and the license fee pair. And that's the most important thing. And I'm 100% there. I wonder, I'm hesitating slightly, but just staying with this theme of anti-Semitism for the moment. And I certainly don't propose to dwell on the kids company episode difficult as it was but again going back to that I think very interesting interview article by Sam Knight of 2016 that I started off with um if I can just quote from yeah. that if I may um talking about the 2015 you know sort of 16 um episode and uh he says the following he says there's been over the years something borderline obsessive and therefore something soci sociologically revealing about the pursuit and the eventual toppling if that's the right word of alan yentov and then this is the crucial bit no one i spoke to for this article wanted to be the first to mention anti-semitism but pretty much everyone else did in the end and then he quotes hanif Qureshi, who we touched on earlier as follows, he says, a posh Jew poncing around at the public expense, what is not to hate? Now, I'm sure that Hanif was very tongue in cheek there, but I just wonder if you'd like to comment on that. Yes, it's good. Well, yes, I can see that. And Hanif is, as you say, never is fearless about these things. In mm -hmm. fact, when I did a program with, uh, Hanif, with Hanif, one of them, there was a, he said to me at one point, Do you have to ask me such stupid questions? And I left it in. Because you know, I found it entertaining. This and of course, it was immediately picked up by others as saying that he. Oh, obviously, he hates him too. I, I think you know clearly there is some of that there. And you know, talking about the, you know, the my my. So I, I've always been someone in the BBC who is both not always actually in the early days I wasn't on camera that much, but later on I was. And so I represented, I was one of the bosses and I was also on television. And that gave the press, mm. uh, certain members of the press, mm. the opportunity to do that. And as you say, when it came to the kids company thing, um, first of all, my phone was hacked uh, for seven years and probably by many more newspapers, we shall hear about it, but I, I won that case against the mirror. And then the kids company thing, I thought was absolutely outrageous what went on absolutely outrageous this was a organization supported to the end uh, by david cameron despite whatever it was also supported by tony blair and gordon brown they all knew you know it was it didn't fit the model and why not because the, the model is broken that's why the whole thing of child protection is broken we can sit here and talk about kids' company and pairs of shoes when you're actually talking about a situation where, where, where abuse of children is, it takes 20, 30 years for some of those local authorities to own up to what went on, or the Catholic Church or elsewhere. And I fear that this system is, is still broken, but because of COVID, because of Ukraine, because of Boris, because of everything else, we don't hear about these things anymore. The mental health of young people is very much at risk. And the, the way that the economy is working now will create disruption in all these families. And I, I fear what the consequences will be. I, I, I need to add that when it comes to what you believe in, for six years, the, well, the official receiver tried to to, dis to stop any members of the, uh, of the kids' company board uh, being on the board of uh, another company. I didn't need to worry about because I, I stepped down from the BBC role at that stage uh, because I, I felt I had to, uh, because it was I was just in the pay, it was all kids' company mm -hmm. and it was getting in the way of the BBC. But I, I carried on more or less doing the same job, just unpaid. And then what happened is, but for the next, there was a 10 week trial and we were totally and completely and utterly vindicated by the judge, who was a woman, by the way. And we had to go through all that. It cost the taxpayer 10 million pounds. Why hasn't this been written about? And the official receiver, according to the judge, should never have brought the case. And, and, that, that, Alan, and I didn't really want to go down that road, so forgive no, me. Okay. Open that up. It's clearly a, still a sore, a sore point for you, and you know, quite understandably. But actually, perhaps just, well, actually, no, let's just leave, leave it at that for the moment. Maybe, and there are big questions beginning to come in, and we must leave time. Yeah, let's do, that. Uh, let's do that. Let's yeah, but maybe just as a last, a last comment from from you. Um, yeah, you know, it's it's you're now in front of the camera. You're making some wonderful programs. Um, not involved. So much behind the scenes 
what is your perception of the BBC now and where might it might it be heading? Pretentious questions, hard to answer. No, no. Well, I I I am still very close to the chairman who is Jewish, by the way. Shh. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, the director general and uh, i'm i'm passionate about the future of the bbc uh, and i believe that its value is underestimated by you know by this government mm. and that really it's crucially important that it's able not just to survive but thrive in the future now the question of how that's funded and the license fee and the rest of it is very important but um i think it's up to people like you it's others you know others must speak up for the bbc we're talking about this hundred years that you're celebrating this is a unique organization and it it's it, it extends and and embraces everyone uh remember that the government has decided that it's appropriate that the BBC should, you, the license fee payer, should pay the bills for the over 75s, should pay for the Welsh language service, should pay for the world service. That's taken 30% of the BBC's income away, which it could have put into programming. I don't approve of this at all. And at the same time, uh, you know, we're, we're talking about one and a half billion pounds taken out of a license fee because the BBC does not have inflation of any kind and inflation is going up at a huge rate. Is that right and fair? No, I don't believe it is. Is it sensible? No. And I believe that people need to speak out, nor do I approve of what's happened to Channel 4, of the argument about Channel 4. But, but hopefully, and I'm actually, you know, I think Rishi Sunak is a decent man and I've spoken to him about the BBC and I'm hoping that Rishi will be supported, but then there are so many other problems in front of him that I don't know if he's going to have the time to pay attention to that. Okay, well, that's my take on All the right. BBC. Get behind it. <laughs> Thank you, Alan. Thank you, Alan. Uh, right, everyone, now's your chance to come forward with questions and comments. We have one from Elaine. I'm sorry, I can't actually read. Is it Gray? Or I can't read the whole, the whole name. Um, perhaps a predictable one, and maybe it's not mainly for Alan to answer, but Alan, we've got you here, so I'm going to ask it. Um, and you've touched on what's going on in the Middle East, and I, you know, I, I think most of us can probably anticipate how you might deal with this question. Anyway, about anti-Semitism and the reporting of it by the BBC, um, it seems to me that the BBC's news services, uh, services reporting is biased against Jews and Israel. To this lady, clearly unacceptable. How do you explain it? I don't think that's true, and mm -hmm. I don't believe that sort of the leadership of the BBC would do that. Have they made mistakes? Perhaps they have, yes. And I think we have to distinguish Israel from mm -hmm. Jews, you know, to the extent that, you know, the, 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 you know it, the, the government in Israel, as you say, I don't approve of the current government in Israel myself, and I don't approve of, I'm disappointed in the way that Israel has dealt with the Palestinian issue over the last years and we haven't resolved it in some way because I think uh, Israel's insights and its techno its insights into technology into all kinds of things could be incredibly valuable in the Middle East and remember my family came from the Middle East originally so I I think um, I can understand why it might upset people at times and the BBC doesn't always get it right but the BBC is not anti-Israel no mm. It'd be interesting to see what Mark de Meza says about it. Uh, yeah. Perhaps from a different different perspective. Thank you. Um, right, a question from Barry Hyman, I believe. Would you like to unmute yourself, Barry, and uh, have your say? Un do you unmute yourself? No, Barry, you need to unmute yourself. Can we do it for him? Barry, we can't hear you. Barry. We can't hear you. We all ought to know this by now, wouldn't we? Barry, I'm sorry. Oh, that's it. Start again. I'm afraid we didn't hear a word. Go on, go on. Sorry, I was pressing the bit button, not the unmute word. All right. Um, okay. Thanks very much. Um, just a couple of things, Alan. Paul Fox, a local friend, I see him regularly, wonderful raconteur like you. Would he not be a great interviewee? He's got a million stories to tell. Yes, yeah, I love what I love Paul Fox. Yeah. Right alive and still fit as a fiddle. Um, I know, he's, uh, he's amazing. Paul yeah. is amazing. 
Um, I take on board everything you say about the Beeb. I'm still a great fan, although some of my friends aren't. I'm a, a junkie at 81 years old. That said, the DG has not covered himself in glory of late in regard to coverage on some of the Arab channels by Al-Bari and some of the things he's been allowed to say, refusing to address the issues as put to him by the JC and other communities. I just wondered if you have a word to say about that. And Yento, unusual name, would it have been Yom Tov there originally? Would you? Know? Yes, yes, it would be, it would be Yom Tov originally, yes. Uh, I, I mean... I can I understand people's concern about this, and I know that things are not always got right. But actually, um, I mean, I've just said that I think the BBC is not, uh, you know, is not uh, anti-Israel, uh, and I, I and I think that, that Tim Davy was probably saying the same thing. And as I said to you, there is a the chairman of the BBC is Jewish, um, uh, Richard Sharp, and so you know, I mean, I think he would be. He makes it clear when he thinks things have gone wrong, and we uh, we've just there did that um, bus journey and the, all the rest of it. That's been acknowledged that it was got wrong, and I think um, the BBC has to own up to mistakes that it makes and work out why they did make those mistakes. I saw the chief rabbi came round uh, to the BBC just recently as well to talk about things, and I saw him when he came. So yes, I'm not being. Um, sort of, I, I'm, I'm not saying that there aren't things the BBC has to answer for. I'm just saying that, as you know, as I say, Mark Damas will tell you, so many of the people running BBC News have been Jewish and they're certainly not anti-Israel. But it's, you know, it's a complex world with thousands of employees and you can't be on top of everything and mistakes are made. Thanks. Okay, pleasure. Thank you. Emma, Emma Brand, I think you've got a question, yeah? Hi, thank you so much for that really fascinating uh, talk. Um, so I, you, you mentioned impartiality quite a few times, um, and I'm just interested from a kind of arts perspective, um, when, you know, how do you program shows that are for everyone, because everyone pays the license fee, reflecting impartiality, but also still kind of retaining some sense of artistic integrity, a message, that kind of thing? Like, where does the balance come in between? What... Okay, well, let me think. I, the most important thing about impartiality is essentially in the news service and the news operation. That's where it's absolutely crucial. In the rest of the world, I think it's sort of, it's not the right word for cultural programs or for drama or for anything like that. I, I think fairness, yes, that's, that's right. And I think impartiality... You could extend that idea saying, to saying that the BBC offers a range of programmes, highbrow, lowbrow, mediumbrow, whatever it is. And in cultural terms, just looking at that, I was a, you know, a bit of a pioneer in this area because I believe that popular culture, the best of popular culture and high culture could sit side by side. An arena, when, it, when we began in those years ago, there were, there were programmes like My Way or the Ford Cortina, which were just as important as, just as, you know, as they were, you know, in a way, they could be playful, but at the same time sit by side with a program about, uh, you know, Picasso or Orson Welles, you know? So uh, I think it's making people think. I mean, for me, you know, curiosity is important. Different people have different interests. So. Not every TV program can appeal to everyone. That's why we have these different channels, BBC One, BBC Two, BBC Four, BBC Three, and why we should retain them. And um, I think I come back to the point of don't underestimate the, you know, what the BBC has managed to achieve, how it's man managed also to, I mean, the, the early news channels, the, 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 the iPlayer, all these things, the BBC thought ahead of the time. It, it tried to modernise itself uh, and uh, it still does. It's t the iPlayer is a streaming service. You can't look, look at it. The BBC is still, you know, doing the linear thing with watching. You can watch, uh, you know, when it's on the TV or increasingly you watch it in your own time. And... Uh, I, I believe that the BBC has shown and proven that it it can reinvent itself and accommodate this new world. It just, 
it needs support and time and mm -hmm. patience. Very much the message that comes across in um, David Hendy's book, which I read with great interest, you know, that it's, of course, it's not perfect. And yet, and yet, what a valuable job it, it does. Indeed, indeed. Thanks, Emma. Um, Aviva, I think you've got something to say. You're muted as well. We're not doing I know, I was just <laughs> unmuting. <laughs> but, like, we're always the ones who do it wrong, right? Those of us who run it for other people. Um, so I've been listening in delight, Alan, to all you've been saying about the great Jewish cultural figures from Harold Pinter to Philip Roth to Tom Stoppard, I'll come back to him in a minute, Jonathan Miller, you know, the list goes on, um, Mel Brooks. Um, by the way, with Tom Stoppard, just to say to everyone, because I thought it was fun, um, the Strausler family, his original birth family that he was a part of, that came out of Zlín, Czechoslovakia, were actually given, well, not given, the visas were got for them by the mother-in-law of someone who's on the Zoom today. Um, wow, amazing. Selena Geller, so amazing story. That's amazing, yeah. um, but just to say, I did notice though, so far, all these amazing Jewish cultural figures are men. So will you tell us a little bit about maybe some of the female Jewish cultural figures you've had experiences with over the years, maybe Mary Margley's, Barbara Streisand, any of the others? Yes, yes. Do you think well, there is a gender issue? Yes. Um, yeah, Barbara Streisand I've met and, and talked to um, uh, as well. Of course, Miriam Margolis, those of you who have seen it, I don't know if you watched the program, um, but that's that's on the iPlayer and that also was sort of, and then I've got some sort of figures who aren't exactly in that realm, but, um, um, you know, there's Ruby Wax, of course, who's a, a friend of mine and who is uh, um, clearly, you know, part of that, uh, that world. Uh, Ruthie Rogers, who runs a river cafe, of course, and uh, and Richard Rogers, her husband, are among my closest friends. So, uh, I, I think you're right. You know, I've, I I'm sort of talking about some of the ones the programs made, but um, um, I certainly, you know, Amy Winehouse approached me, wanted me to make a film about her, and unfortunately, she died before. And every time we had a meeting plan, she she didn't turn up and I went to her funeral and she had seen the program of Mel Brooks and wanted therefore to make me to make a program about her. So, you know, there are, and then there are quite a lot of, you know, Jewish, British Jewish actresses as well. Uh, and certainly American ones who are, you know, but I, but in a way those are, I don't know, it's, it's often the ones I'm making the shows with. I make a lot of shows about, women there have been a lot on lately but um um i'm not sure whether i mean there are quite a lot of other names but you know i, I i've done my name dropping for <laughs> I I just, sorry viewer, can i just sort of come in there um i prefer not so much well, brings in gender but also this once again the issue of jewishness i've you know the most recent imagine uh, programs I've seen recently were firstly the Mallory Blackman one which I greatly enjoyed and then the William Kentridge and I just by the way was able to see his exhibition in Lithuania just recently. Uh, oh. Interesting side sort of side life um, but no I was very struck I mean Mallory Blackman obviously her blackness and indeed her gender are absolutely centre stage of everything she does and everything she represents. In the case of William Kentridge, as I recall, and forgive me if I've got this slightly wrong, um, you mentioned his Jewish background, but what you don't probe, I think quite significantly, or I, I was certainly interested by the fact that you appeared not to probe the or the potential significance of his Jewishness in his stance against apartheid as a white Jewish male in South Africa. And I just wondered if you wanted to comment on that at all. It seemed to me that that was perhaps a missed opportunity, dare I say it, to actually probe what I think is quite important, the importance of Jewishness in standing out up for, you know, sort of race equality and other other moral, you know, moral. Well, I, I, I felt um, it spoke for itself in a funny yeah. way. And once again, I'm more reluctant to sort of, you know, to sort of promote Jewishness in quite that way. I've already, I do mm. promote it hugely because, all these programs that I've talked about all do engage with it. With the Kentridge one, I just don't think my own family uh, were in South Africa for a while. My uncle um, 
ran a company there in Johannesburg. And uh, I think there is actually quite substantial Jewish community in South Africa, white Jewish community. Uh, I think, I don't think William would have wanted to, to, to have that label on him. He, he certainly is a Jew, but I, I don't think he would feel that it was to do with his, he's, I didn't even talk about his generosity of spirit. I mean, he's just a man who, his father, as you would have seen from the program, was, he was 100 years old last week. Mm. And he is the man who, you know, who represented Mandela and others, um, you know, in, uh, you know, in their legal cases and the fight against the apartheid state. So yes, you know, maybe I could have said something about that, but I, I would have found that difficult to say, to be honest with you. It's interesting because you seem to have no problem at all sort of identifying some of the great names of modern culture, if you like, as Jewish. But it seems to me that there's another way of looking at Jewishness, and that is that sense of kind of moral responsibility for trying to make the world a better place. This sounds horribly pretentious, but I hope you know what I mean, that actually that's what makes a person's Jewishness significant. Well, maybe, but I'm not um, campaigning. I mean, I'm, no, no, no. I, I, you know, I'm making arts programs. So, uh, you know, in that sense, that's another. I made a film too with Amos Oz, I have to mm. say, as, as well, and who was a good friend. And uh, we miss him. He's another one who's, mm. who's gone yeah. recently, you know. Um, and that was very much, that was interesting, of course, because that was, he was someone who believed in Israel and lived that life, but had also fallen out at certain stages. Uh, with you know governments in Israel, uh, although not, although had become more integrated at the end himself and more aware of the challenges that just don't go away if you're if you're an Israeli or anyone living there. Yeah, indeed, indeed. Now I'm looking at the clock. If anybody has any questions or comments, now is the last chance to to. Uh, bring them in. I'll give you a few more minutes. Maybe, Alan, we could just end by you telling us a little bit more about projects in the pipeline. What do we have to look forward to? Well, um, there is tonight there's a film on, which is about a man called Douglas Stewart, and who's who wrote the Booker Prize winning book, Shaggy Bane. And that will be on at 10 40 i'm afraid after the news where some people will <laughs> fall asleep by then but it's on the iplayer after that um i'm also making a film about another person who is is jewish uh, but didn't really necessarily clock it till rather later in his life and that's a very a, a, a very talented director who's now 81 himself <coughs> called stephen frears and um, I'll be making a film with him, making a film with French and Saunders, I hope, <coughs> with Wes Anderson, the American film director. Um, so things unfolding. <coughs> I think we've probably made you talk enough, have you? Aviva, did you want to add something? I feel, feel I rather butted in. Um, no, it's, it's absolutely fine. Um, I, I was just, since I do have the privilege of the last question then, because I am going to tie it up by thanking, though I don't want to make Alan work too hard, but I just wanted to ask a question maybe about Jewish humour, because that seems to me to be brought to a lot of what you do, a kind of warmth and humorous edge, even when talking about difficult subjects. And I wonder if you think that is a specifically Jewish mm. thing where it comes from. A very good point. I, you're absolutely right. I I absolutely believe that Jewish humour is very special. And I talked about with Mel Brooks, but you can think about lots of Jewish stand-ups and comedians who are also very funny. Um, Jewish writers and literature. Yes, I think that's a very special talent that I do agree and that I'm certainly on the lookout for. Um, and being able to combine wit and humour with with storytelling, which has also got sadness and other things in it, and grief even. Mm. I think those are very mm. Jewish qualities, yes. 
Well, I think that's probably the perfect place to end, really, with that blend of wit, warmth and tragedy that makes up the Jewish aesthetic and has been so much a part of this evening. Um, we're so grateful. First of all, Monica, thank you for initiating the conversation. But thank you so much, Alan. We know how phenomenally busy you are and for taking the time to share all these amazing anecdotes with us um, and treat us like part of your extended family, <laughs> especially when we can hear you're not very well. So we hugely appreciate it. And I just want to pick up, um, Alan's already talked about one of the forthcoming talks we have with Mark Damaza, which will address those news and politics question. Um, Mark was news editor for the BBC. He was a commissioner. He was the editor of Newsnight for many years. He was the founding of BBC, founder of BBC News 24. So we'll absolutely take those on. But before we get to him in that finale of the series, just to say no, Next week, we're going to focus still on the arts, but we're going to focus on three of the great Jewish dramatists, two of whom you've mentioned actually so far. Um, we're going to look at Jonathan Miller, both as a comedian, a maker of factual documentaries, but also as a theatre producer. You've got his son. It's talking his about. son, William, we'll be talking William, about. William, I know well, yes. Good. We have... Amy Rosenthal, talking about her father, Jack Rosenthal. Oh, yes, another very fabulous playwright. In yeah. British TV, yeah. And of course, they were both commissioned by Martin Eslin, who was the head of drama. Yeah. Head of drama. And he was also the expert on Harold Pinter, as well as on Brecht and others. But he was the person who first brought Harold Pinter to fame by producing his radio plays. Yeah. Um, so we're going to they were extraordinary. You know, yeah. no, I, Harold was a very good friend of mine too, and we really miss him, I must say. Yeah. So, Monica Eslin Paird, who's Martin's daughter, is going to be talking about her father. So, we right. have these three children on their fathers, and they're going to be chaired by Caroline Raphael, who was the first female head of drama at the BBC, and you can hear by the name also Jewish. So I do, do hope you'll come back next week. And thank I'll definitely you again. Watch them, yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you again, Alan, for yeah, everything. Thank you, everyone. For right. Enjoy the rest yeah. of your evening. <laughs> and at 10.40, turn on your BBC television and you will see. Imagine. <laughs> One should also just add, Aviva, that next week is not the last. There is more, more in store. Uh, but anyway, we'll, we'll tell you more next week. <laughs> Very good. Thank you.